Hello, everybody, and welcome to Fashion and Sustainability in Action, the role of support organisations. Thank you for joining us this afternoon, the third in our webinar series around FSP. The event is part of Fostering Sustainable Practices Project, what fashion design entrepreneurship actually means in the context of our times. It offers insights into what is possible in terms of good work, resourceful practice, trusted relationships and creative freedom. It also has collated an evidence base of the gaps, opportunities and barriers to being able to thrive through pursuing values-led design. Design that's for the benefit of the people involved directly, for the benefit of society, wider economies and cultures, all recognizing ad identities within Earth's living systems. Fostering Sustainable Practices is funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council and supported by University of the Arts London, Middlesex University and the Open University. As I said, this is the third webinar this week. Uh, for details of the background to the research, please check our website. We have a Fostering Sustainable Practices page, various blog posts and the recordings of all the previous events will be on this page too. But this afternoon, I am particularly delighted to be joined by a number of people who have been working on the project together. We've been together for nearly three years now. First of all, Alfredo Orobio from Away to Mars, founder of Away to Mars. Sabina Rachimova, who is the founder of Sabina. Judith Tolley, who is the head of business incubation at the Center for Fashion Enterprise. Monica Bukeneng, and Professor Sandy Black and Dr. Mila Berchikova, all from Center for Sustainable Fashion, and Dr. Philippa Cromantian Marsh, I don't think I've got that right, have I? Uh, who is from the Open University, all of whom have been really involved in the project in very distinctive ways. Uh, Zoe is also with us from Center for Sustainable Fashion, the project manager, although I think she's lurking in the background under UAL. Um, and yeah, Zoe is putting links to the panelists' work into the chat. So please, can I ask the audience um, any comments, thoughts, and questions that you have? Please put them into the Q and A. <coughs> so we're here today to talk about the what and the how of supporting and being supported as a micro and small business practicing sustainability. The project team has gathered over a hundred interviews and analyzed them to create an evidence base of sustainability in action. It demonstrates new possibilities for the fashion sector in the UK that can create with earth and social equity front of mind. The evidence has, been, has enabled us to develop a guide for what we call supporters. Also, you know, we, we call them intermediaries, the people and the organizations who invest showcase, mentor, advise, and otherwise amplify, inspire, and critically offer a vital means for these designers and businesses to succeed in their ambitions, big and small. We found actually that the, the idea of supporters and who these supporters are include the businesses themselves. There's an amazing new definition of how designers are working. They're supporting each other and working in ways that can enhance overall what the SME sector, the micro and small business sector is able to do. The guide introduces ways to recognize designers whose practices do or could contribute to cultures, societies, and ecological and economic systems that are life and livelihood sustaining, as well as creatively fulfilling. The guide contains tips, methods, and practical examples for those who support fashion designers to help them to identify and promote businesses that can flourish and that can evidence long-term prosperity. It shows that fashion can be decarbonized and decolonized, but these practices not, must be recognized and amplified if fashion is to be something that we can be proud to work in and to wear. We're all part of a dynamic system of relationships. We all support people, we're all supported. So the guide is there to look at actually what prosperity can look like in each of these businesses but also to shine a light on what micro and small businesses uh, can do, the difference that those who support them can make. Micro and small businesses make, over up, make up over 99% of businesses in the UK. They contribute to nearly half of UK employment and between a third and half of its revenue. And for us at University of the Arts, it's a particularly relevant 
area to, to focus on because more of our graduates set up their own businesses than graduates from Oxford and Cambridge combined. So a little context to, to the work is that the guidebook is really about how we can, we can amplify this practice. It's gonna be launched next week um, and it will be open source to everybody who wants to be able to have access to it. That it involves um, an exploration of the, the understanding of prosperity across those four terms, what it looks like in action, how it can be supported, and critically some case studies from the research as well. And then just for reference, uh, the descriptor that we use in the guide is that sustainable prosperity is a state of personal, cultural, societal, and environmental thriving within planetary boundaries. And overall, the fashion system is very far from this state. So today we wanna to talk about what we can learn from the research, um, about who, what, where, and how sustainable prosperity is realized in fashion. So hence the, the great panel that we've got here today. So maybe if I can ask everybody to turn their cameras on uh, so that everybody can see who, who you are um, and uh, please, yeah, put on your microphones as we, as we speak. But maybe if I can turn first of all to Mila. Mila, uh, you have been working on this project very intensely for yeah, nearly three years now um, and working with Monica and myself very specifically on the guidebook. Can I ask you, what does sustainable prosperity look like from your work in the guide? What insights have really informed this research? Thank you, Delis, and hello, everyone. It's great to be here and share some of our work. Uh, so I'll introduce you briefly to sustainable prosperity and how we approached it in the guide. As Delis said, you will have the opportunity to read about it in more detail next week, but I'll give you the first sort of look at what you may expect in, in the guide. So for those of you who were in our Monday discussion and introduction to the project, we said that to look uh, at sustainable prosperity across the four agendas of culture, society, environment, and economy, we first need to look at what we value as individuals, as society, and as businesses. Because what we value affects what we do, it defines our conversations and also our everyday decisions. And I use this quote from the economist Mariana Mazzucato, who says that in a society where value is defined by uh, what fetches a price, then something that does fetch that price is seen as creating value. However, if profit is the only measure of value, and by extension, the only measure of success. Businesses that harm the environment and exploit people and perpetuate fashion cultures that create very homogenous culture of fashion are still considered valuable and successful. But this is exactly what we say needs to change uh, if we are talking about sustainable prosperity. And for our research, as Bill has already said, we have found strong evidence that this is already happening. And our work on the guide and the guide is the place where we want to bring this all into one place with all the evidence and all the actions that can be taken as a result. So the businesses we have been working with think, act and measure success in much broader terms than just so solely financial profit. And thanks to their human scale, what is successful is considered in relationship to their own personal values and the fulfillment and satisfaction that they draw from their work. As Lilith said also in her introduction, sustainable in prosperity is then a state where individuals and cultures, societies and the environment can all thrive within planetary boundaries. Sustainable prosperity means for example, long-term quality of life for people and nature everywhere. It cares for nature because rich biodiversity, clean water, air, and fertile soil are all critical for the well-being of everyone and everything on Earth. Sustainable prosperity also recognizes that economic prosperity is critical for global equality. 
but on its own, just as the sole measure, it is an insufficient metric of human well-being. Sustainable prosperity enables decent work and long-term livelihoods for people everywhere. It also allows enough time, energy, and opportunities for personal development and participation in society and culture. And subjective measures such as happiness, satisfaction, and finding meaning in life are highly valued in sustainable prosperity. So from our work with over 40 small and micro businesses over the two and a half years, some of the examples of what these businesses value and how they measure success in relationship to sustainable prosperity may include, for example, proof of concept, which means striking a kind of balance between traditional metrics of success, such as turnover, annual growth, wholesale orders, stockists, or media endorsement, and then their own measures of success uh, that are much more personal and draw on their personal values. So, for example, a social and environmental impact and personal creative integrity, fulfilling work, or simply delighting others by their designs. They also value establishing trust that results from building long-term relationships with people they work with and uh, their customers. But most importantly, perhaps in this context, what we want to draw attention to with the relationship with sustainable prosperity is that many of the businesses we've spoken to do not necessarily aspire to continuous growth and expansion of their business. They consider themselves successful if they reach a level of maturity that allows their business to be self-sufficient without compromising their values creating a space where they can allow their own creativity flourish, uh, meeting their sustainability aims and be free in their choice of suppliers and manufacturers. And many of them have consciously downscaled their operations or cut production even to stay true to what they believe in. So this is in a nutshell from me on what we talk about when we say sustainable prosperity in connection to micro and small businesses. And my colleagues later will talk about how these new measures of success can be implemented, supported, and hopefully also amplified by those who, who support these businesses in all manners of ways. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mila. And um, there's so much in there, um, which is not surprising, the amount of, of time and, and uh, interrogation into the, to the work that you've been doing. I wonder actually if I could turn to Alfredo um, as somebody who's helped to inform this work. Um, Mila has just talked uh, a lot about the relational elements of, of sustainable prosperity and relationships of trust and so with the way to Mars, you know, the relationships be between all elements of fashion you, you look at from a, a very non-conventional perspective and you challenge what, uh, what it means to, to have trusted relationships and what they look like. So I wonder if I could ask you, um, you know, what does sustainable prosperity mean to you um, and how has it evolved um, based on your values in a way to Mars? Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Tillis, for having us. And it's, uh, it's great because uh, we started discussing this uh, three years ago, uh, pre-pandemic, and now we are just releasing this when we are starting to get back to normal. So uh, it's quite like I think it's, uh, a big sign of um, good things. Um, I think uh, when when we started away to Mars, uh, my main goal was to create something. Uh, different. I didn't want to create a, a brand that were just uh, uh, aiming for profit, for volumes, for sales. Uh, I, I want to create a, a community and I want to support other people um, to design and to collaborate and to improve uh, in their careers. And I think sustainability was, uh, uh, was we were starting to talk about sustainability at the time. Uh, it was uh, still a very new uh, subject. And I, I 
I, I've struggled a lot in the beginning to understand uh, what was sustainability and Judith the, uh, uh, started a journey with us, uh, the, the, the CFE, since uh, we started. Uh, she she experienced that with us, like how how hard was to to get a quality information and how to how how a, a startup a, a small fashion brand could uh, innovate and apply sustainable techniques um, without without um, uh, cash uh, without money to expand in research and development. So I think uh, one of the the, the key. Uh, elements that uh, I think uh, always I want to stress is the importance of uh, the CFE, the BFTT, all these schemes. Uh, there are uh, there are these joint ventures between the academia and the government to support um, business like us uh, to achieve and to understand what uh, what is sustainability and how we can apply sustainability to our business. Uh, I think. Um, it's still a very new uh, subject. Uh, uh, I struggle to tell my friends about sustainability and people that are not in the industry, they don't know like what, what is it, it's only about organic cotton or, uh, and they don't know the entire universe that, is, uh, that we are trying to achieve. And, uh, and it's, I think it's very important the report that, that you guys did uh, because it plays a key role on educating uh, the consumers. And I think consumers are, 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 are a key element and a key uh, player uh, on, on, on pushing other companies and pushing the government and pushing the academia to, to understand and to explore more of the sustainability uh, side. Thank you, Alfredo. Um, and yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot there in what you're saying. And I thought maybe actually if I turn to Judith uh, and, uh, and ask her, because from a perspective of, of, yeah, of what to draw on, what is important, what to measure, what counts, what is counted. You know, you sit in quite a, a tricky position because what you think counts and what your values are and what the people who are funding your work might think counts or the people that you're, that you're supporting, how they're measured, all of these things are, are sometimes at odds. And you've got great experience, um, as I've heard said, in supporting micro and small designers in their businesses and your insights have been really vital to, to this project and in creating the, the guide very directly. What do you think support organization, organizations can learn from the guidebook? Um, what does sustainable prosperity mean for you when sitting in this position of supporting businesses that are values led, but in a world that doesn't necessarily recognize their values? Um, oh, hi, hi, everyone. Yeah, really interested to talk about this. And actually, it's really funny, because one of the things that I was thinking was, please don't ask me what cultural prosperity is, <laughs> because actually, I think we're still finding out. And uh, it was one of the things that uh, uh, Mila and Monica and I talked about a lot. And my, my question to them was all, always, what does that really mean? How people going to know when they are when they have cultural and uh, uh, cultural prosperity in their business and it's more about how is a business going to be acting and behaving and actually what are they going to be doing differently uh, because it is a real personal journey and I see the guide as a coaching document more the coaching document in terms of where it's not us saying you need to be doing this and you need to be doing that it's this is the landscape this is what's going on what do you need to be doing in your business what can you do in your business um, what do you need to be doing differently um, and you know what's realistic for you because one of the things you know, I noticed very early on is uh, businesses who didn't have sustainability embedded into their business wanted to do it, but didn't know how. They really didn't know how and they didn't know where to start. And I had some, you know, very uh, complex conversations with business owners who were quite upset. Uh, you know, it's like, it's such a big subject. What do, where do I start? And it's so interesting to hear Alfredo. I love to hear your story because when I remember seeing you, you came in and you were working uh, on one of our programs, which was around, you know, fashion tech, uh, which was, you know, new for us, not just supporting traditional fashion businesses. I just thought, I really, 
I, re I see something really different, but actually I don't understand how this is going to work. I really don't, I can't quite see it, but I know that what you're doing is great and I know that there's something there. And I think what's interesting for me is to think about actually you, from where you started, you know, you've had re a re it's been a real journey and you've had, you've pivoted and you've slightly changed things that you've done and how you've done them, but always, you know, uh, uh, that community um, um, at the core. And I think, you know, it's our job as sport organisations to help businesses make the change. So it requires a huge amount of listening to them and um, using this tool, tool uh, this guide to um, stimulate thinking. It's about creating that thinking environment of, okay, so, you know, what, what could you do how are you how are you going to do it what am i you know if i'm behaving in that way what am i doing differently how am i acting and what's going on and it's a continual journey thank you judith yeah oh, there's so much in there so we could have an hour talking about cultural sustainability actually maybe that's the next webinar um and yeah certainly the idea of what counts and what people think they they need to see and we're, we're so stuck with metrics that are the quantitative and numbers and actually this work isn't all about numbers um but yeah um and great segue into to talking to monica so uh yeah the conversation that you guys have been having uh and also from your perspective you also sit between you know on your on your um in your role in the knowledge exchange work that you do you work with businesses large and small you guide and have written guides for, for designers in very big businesses, as well as in small businesses, um, and in your, from your own practice as well, thinking about the economies of, of, of fashion and uh, what it means to be a designer. Can I ask you then, uh, from, from your perspective, what, um, what, what are the insights from this project that really have stood out to you? How do you think that we can support each other in realizing sustainable prosperity? Yeah, absolutely. And this is Judith and Alfredo have made excellent, excellent points that I kind of want to touch on. Um, particularly one of those first conversations with Judith when we were starting to develop the actual written guide and not just all the mad notes that Mila had uh, and I had scattered across the walls. It was like, what does this actually mean? And that was kind of the key insight to developing the guidebook was like, okay, great. We've managed to define it, which was a battle in itself, but what does this mean for MSCs and what does this mean for support organisations? How can we develop these hands-on sections to, put, to get readers putting these things into practice? Um, and that was really, really interesting, actually, because, you know, our original or our target audience is the support organisations and the intermediaries. But we were kind of realising that it had wider applicability across the entire fashion industry, because, you know, from my work with larger corporates, I could see a lot of the same values and insights and takeaways being applied, say, at ASOS right through to the tiny, you know, one or two uh, employee organisations. It's that same kind of framework and thinking. And so as part of the writing process, you know, we were looking at sort of three key areas. Alfredo, you picked up on a couple of them just previously, but, you know, there are so many common goals and so many common challenges that these MSEs have. Um, and it is quite difficult, you know, it's a different landscape for a lot of people and a lot of different things to address. And so we wanted to make sure that we could address these challenges, not only with the practical solutions, uh, things like, you know, support with finance and support with studio space, but also mindsets. And as Judith kind of picked up, what are the behaviors that need to change? What are the attitudes that need to change? And how can the guidebook we develop support those across all four agendas and all four perspectives? Um, so we wanted to kind of balance that. We're not just looking at, oh, you know, you need to offer funding to more sustainable uh, MECs, or we want to be showcasing sustainable designers, but how can we actually think about getting them to address their values, their ambitions, their goals, their performance indicators from these new definitions of success that Mila touched on earlier. And I think that was a really important insight was the fact that it's not just people and planet. We want those four agendas addressed equally or in a way that really works for the MSC. So it's across culture, it's across society, it's across the economy and across environment, finding that little sweet spot, as you can see on some of the diagrams of how we can address all of those instead of focusing solely on one or two. It's kind of a holistic and a deeper approach to sustainability, creating a framework where we can actually 
monitor and validate that progress. And also, you know, it creates a lens through which for some of those more traditional activities like studio space or financing or networking or business management, etc. How can we reconsider those um, through the four perspectives and all of the insights that came out of the interviews and all of the research progress and put that into a nice small document, you know, only, only 200 pages or so um, about what that actually looks like in practical terms. And that was the really exciting thing to see. Thanks, Monica. Yeah, and yeah, working our way through this. I think it would have been a thousand pages if we'd uh, had our way. Luckily, our wonderful graphic designer kind of kept reminding us, that, <laughs> and actually Judith, more than anybody, kept reminding us that, uh, yeah, this needs to be something that people can, uh, can have access to and make their way through. So hopefully we've now got a navigation system that means that people can can go into it from different angles and then keep going back to the to the contents page but yeah the uh the the sort of rich depth of it and and you know mon working particularly on that practicality of what it looks like is the most difficult bit in some ways um uh, because yeah if, if if we've got all these great ideas but we don't know we can't share them in a way that's going to be useful um then then yeah we we're not really fulfilling our roles either so Maybe Sabina, if I can, if I can come to you next, and I see you also defying convention in very many ways, um, and yeah, re, re, re describing what it means to be a fashion design entrepreneur. Um, so, can I ask you to tell us a little bit about what what that means? What fashion design entrepreneurship actually means in, in your what have you, what have you done, and what support do you need in being able to really realize sustainable prosperity? Yeah, sure. Well, hi, everyone. It's lovely being here. Um, that's a very long, uh, difficult question. And the answer is not easy either. I'll try to break it down in a few parts. So I had quite a journey as a fashion entrepreneur so far. And it took me a while to understand myself, what my responsibilities are as a fashion entrepreneur, what responsibilities I have as a founder, especially when and talking about sustainability when selling and making products that we mark as sustainable. Um, I think that's also what brought us to um, the business and having a business as it is at the moment, because what we do is we are making and selling sustainable fashion through an educational approach, which means we have sustainable products, but we also have conscious experiences in the form of webinars, a podcast, um, workshops where people can learn skills as well. So it's a lot about the exchange between us and our community so that we are being held accountable for what we promise in terms of sustainability by getting direct feedback from our customers. So this helps both sides. The customers are learning, um, but we are also finally defining sustainability and consciousness in a proper way. Because we all know, you know, as Alfredo mentioned, sustainability wasn't what it is a few years back. And I started uh, six years ago to go with my um, own brand and it was quite confusing it was so easy to claim something and say something without validating it and now we're in a time where we made this jump uh, where greenwashing is a thing because we missed that important part of defining frameworks and validating those so it's quite an exciting space to be a fashion entrepreneur today but as I'm a trained designer and I come from a maker perspective and I learned handcraft as a child from my grandmother, that's how I started in the fashion world. For me, it's super important to make this bridge and, and kind of close this gap between making, manufacturing, the product itself, and then everything that is on the business side, because business concepts change so much. It's not about having this, you know, classic business these days where you're having season after season after season, trying to sell as many products as possible, try to scale as much as possible and growth, you know, a never ending growth story uh, that is defined as success. Um, it's very different these days. And I think that's the uh, exciting part for fashion entrepreneurs. How do you make this link to have a product or a service that is needed, whereas there's demand for it as well, but also have a concept behind it that makes sense for you as a founder so you can help have a healthy and good life and a long life hopefully as well. But it also makes from, um, sense from a financial perspective that uh, you can sustain your own business and be sustainable uh, financially as well. So it's quite a tricky one. And I think sustainability is also nothing that can be a USB. Um, for an entrepreneur or for a business, it has to be the norm. And we are moving towards that world where this is going to be the norm. We're not talking, of course, how we define it. I am a bit worried about the whole greenwashing aspect, but we are all working on it. That's why we're all here together and having this conversation and exchanging. But there will be a future where we need to define that um, business concept and business um, model aspect 
way more to um, understand or to, to see what the USPs can be, because it's not going to be about a sustainable product. Or all products and services will be sustainable as a norm. It's about the concept behind it. What is this extra bit that you can offer, which makes you stand out? And in terms of um, support that you were asking about, I think there's a lot of peer-to-peer -peer support that is crucial and that is helping a lot because I'm part of the Trampery, for example. So the beautiful studio you see in the background, it's in Fish Island Village. And we are seven wonderful studios here on a one road just next to each other. And we moved here in November, 2019. And it was a game changer for me because sometimes I'm just sitting here and just not sure if my idea is good. So I just walk out walk around the corner, go to Bean, to Genia from Bean London, which is a fantastic uh, company doing uh, recycled materials bags. And I'll just pitch my idea and be like, Genia, what do you think? And she'll be like, oh no, don't do it. Amazing. So I got my feedback, I go back and I don't do it. But it's so crucial to have this peer-to-peer -peer exchange because being a founder can be so lonely. It's just you, your ideas, your vision, no one understands what you want and you have it to do list that is just never ending it's constantly growing and never getting smaller but having this peer-to-peer -peer support is crucial and even i think for events like today for us getting together and just listening to each other uh, that brings us forward thanks Vinna. great yeah again there's a, there's so much that i could i could ask and i'm sure there are other people want to ask uh, in relation to, to what you said as well and, and the idea of of the peer-to-peer -peer support is something that we've really found and 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 it's interesting because obviously we work with students with with small businesses and large and and finding the space or a sort of a safe space for people to be able to ask each other about their work and to get some 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 feedback and honest feedback but feedback that is supportive and and constructive um i think is is really critical and so maybe if I can uh, ask you, Sandy, as somebody who's had a small business, who yes. has worked for many, many years in supporting small businesses, <coughs> PhD students, um, a, sort of across the gamut, this idea of a space, a safe space to be able to really ask the questions that you need to ask and to understand yeah. you know, what, what the relationship is between um, academia and industry. Um, you know, I think you're, you know, you're so well placed to for me to ask this question of of what what does it mean to be supportive across academia and industry, yeah. Um, and, and yeah, what what does that look like in terms of of sustainable prosperity? Yeah, well, thank you, Dillis, and thanks everybody. Yeah, following on from Sabina, um, I think that peer to peer support is incredibly important. That was uh, certainly um, a point that I was. Um, uh, going to make because some of the most valuable support comes in that way everything from who's who might or might not be a good or bad payer um, or how to access certain um, facilities or um, suppliers or manufacturers and so on but the issue of sustainability has become um, you know getting getting knowledge I think is really important so I mean a lot of things haven't changed um, you know for businesses that are, are small and trying to stay micro and I think it's appreciating the diversity um, of ways of doing business and also I think that issue of what's enough what's sufficient um, that uh, Sabina just said this the not necessarily the pursuit of, of, of growth because there's such a lot of pressure on people um, and they feel that sort of burnout if they're in the, 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 the traditional what has become been the traditional fashion cycles and I think that appreciation for things that can be done differently um, and, and led by purpose um, and also more direct to consumer engagement has been something that's been extremely coming out of the research that we've done um, but so for me some of those things are very much uh, ongoing also the idea of finance uh, at appropriate finance at appropriate times and not just focusing on um, the startup stage um, but the stages that um, keep going I mean one of our designers actually um, said that um you know that it, it's hard to be sort of middle because all the all the support is 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 um identified for people who are at the um beginning and and it somehow sort of it's you're not so recognized if people already know what you do and i think that's that's tough um and i do think that the relationship between um, some of the previous projects that um i i've um, worked in have particularly tried to sort of connect in a more porous way 
um, academia and the industry, because I think that relationship and academia is able to provide some spaces and provide connection. And we found through the interviews that that even what we've done, there is a space we've created just doing the interviews, a space for reflection and connection with people. I hope that Sabina, for instance, and Alfredo would agree. Um, that 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 in itself has has sometimes provided um, an interest. It's not often people step back from their businesses or have the time to do that. And so I think academia has a really important role in research in in um, bridging those gaps. And this is refers to the work that obviously on Monica and the team do through um, directly. And so I've also always positioned my research in, in that area. So we've been able to create space for people. And um, and sometimes that the research funding, when when for instance we've been able to provide businesses with a, a tiny amount of funding to do some research, that's been a game changer for them, and they've been able to explore new areas that would never have um, come before. So I think um, I think that's something that has only recently been recognised. And then overlaying on everything that a business has to do, adding in the sustainability agenda, which of course now, uh, as Sabina rightly says, you know, has to be sort of a given, uh, there's no other way. I think that those that those elements of support, that's obviously why we have the guidebook, which um, has, has been necessary because we found that, that people want a resource, they want access to resources that's ideally a one-stop shop um, so that we can support businesses, we can support those who are supporting businesses. So I think the connections that, and the sort of the shifting of the paradigm for, for fashion about making only what is needed, um, making things that are cherished for a long time and that have a, that consumers and can have a direct engagement in. All of those need to come, come together in, in sustainable prosperity, I think. Thank you very much, Sandy. Um, and yeah, I, I wonder from what you said, and um, well, there's a lot of questions from what you said, but the, about appropriate finance, you know, the Queen's speech last week talked about people being able to have a, a grant for over their lifetimes from an education perspective. Maybe there needs to be something for businesses that they can get a grant and they can use it as and when over the lifetime of the business rather than only yeah. at specific times. Um, yeah, it could be very interesting to, to another another webinar. We've got two more webinars then coming up. <laughs> um, Philippa, you have been very uh, distinctly working with businesses and with support organisations beyond the realms of us at UAL that are very London centric sometimes. <laughs> Not yeah. always, actually, having said that, I, I take that back immediately because Mila is living in France and <laughs> uh, we, 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 aren't, we aren't only based in London, but we, 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 our, relation, our direct relationships have tended to be uh, with people in London. As Sabina said, you, you can walk down the corridor or, or go across town and, and, and see somebody. You've been going around the country and speaking to people in organizations and businesses um, uh, particularly in, in, in areas that um, have got uh, textiles and fashion manufacturing as, as their core. Can you tell us something about what you think um, designers need uh, in terms of being supported around sustainability and also what the support organisations need um, from your experience and from the interviews that you've, you've taken part in? Yes, yeah, certainly. Yes. Yeah, so um, just firstly, a little bit um, um, I was doing quite a bit of research around the Leicester area, which is, as you know, is um, very much still a textiles area. Um, and I, I did also to take part in some of the research in London as well. And one thing that is very striking is that there is a difference between London <laughs> and somewhere like Leicester. There's actually quite a big difference, actually. Um, certainly the scene in London is much more advanced, certainly in terms of sustainability. Um, and I think there are lots of aspects in London that really um, help designers. Um, for example, Sabina was talking about the peer-to-peer -peer support. And certainly in the research, this has been such a crucial um, support for, for businesses, particularly sustainable ones, because you have, to, as, as, as somebody rightly, so, rightly said, you have so much to do, not only in establishing your business, but also the sustainability side. You have to research into materials. Um, and, and ethical manufacturing and things like that. So um, 
certainly that peer to group peer support is very, very important. Um, now, one case study that we had um, is based in the north of Leicestershire. I didn't have that, did not have that peer peer support. And even more crucially, didn't have that support organisation as well. Um, so as a, as a result, was struggling quite, quite a lot in getting started. Um, so, so, for, so to sort of answer your questions, firstly, I think there is still a geographical difference in terms of support peer-to-peer -peer and also support organisations. But also um, we did survey some support organisations that were relatively lo local to her and we, we identified two sort of key issues. Um, because um, it was very little understanding of what sort of sustainable businesses actually need. And, and as Judith pointed out, out earlier, you know, it's a very complex issue, isn't it, sustainability? Um, and so firstly, in, in one example, um, there was a manager that we spoke to of a shared workspace, and it was clear that he had little or no understanding of sustainability. And so as a consequence, couldn't give any help, any advice to the creative businesses that were there. Um, and then there was a second example that we had, um, a case study who went to her local business advisor who very much was focused on growth. How are you going to grow your business? And in common with a lot of small sustainable fashion businesses, she did not want to grow. She was a one person um, business. And you know, her ideas of growth was maybe having an apprentice. Um, but uh, in it, it said, but um, of course, you know, she didn't really get on with that whole growth growth idea. Um, and so um, was, was very uncomfortable with that. Um, we, we followed this up a bit, you know, why is there so much focus on growth and not understanding the whole principles behind sustainable fashion business? And it was really, it, what, what it's really about, the whole push for growth um, comes, comes from, um, for jobs, for employment. So that was sort of the sort of thinking behind this. And so uh, to me, it really demonstrated that support organisations really do need a lot of education about sustainability and also support themselves. So I'm very hopeful that this sustainable fashion guide would be a great help in sort of addressing this knowledge gap. Thank you, Philippa. Thank you. Um, and yeah, really important for us to, 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 to see and understand that you know, it's it's very different for for different support organisations as well as for different businesses, mm. uh, and 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 how and how to support the support organisations in some cases as well. Um, we've got quite a lot of questions coming in, but before we turn to the questions, um, can I just for five minutes ask whether anybody in the panel has got any questions for anybody else in the panel? Um, would anybody like to clarify or to pick up on any of the points that anybody else has made, Judith? Yes, a uh, really fantastic um, uh, conversation of, with Philippa um, around growth and uh, made me think a lot about how we ran our sports organisation um, for the last 11 years, um, which was through EU funding. And the EU funding, uh, we had outputs and the outputs were a lot about job creation. Mm. So job creation requires businesses to create more turnover. Mm. So yeah, exactly. Someone. They always need to have someone in their business, you know, to help, um, you know, a one person business is quite tough. So, you know, two people in business is better than one, but it doesn't have to be, we need five employees, 10 employees, 15 employees. So um, now I'm supporting businesses at Poplar in, um, a, 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 in a new way where we have selected businesses to go into seven studios that are supported by LCF where they, are, it's about building community. It's about uh, uh, skills and things that people can share. That's how we selected the businesses. But what's different is every single business I'm supporting there is not about growth. Mm. None of them. Uh, they are developing, they are growing, and some of them are growing you know, faster than others. Some of them are having to recruit, but that's not their motivation for running their business. And mm. um, it's it's a really it's a really different thing, and that's what I'm seeing as the new 
business models and new ways of working that is happening, which is fantastic because for years we've been going on and on and on about, you know, the, 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 the traditional model of running a business and running a fashion business is broken. So, uh, you know, for me, it's like, oh, yeah, suddenly things have started to change, which is great. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Judy. Thank you. Can I ask Alfredo and Sabina if, if you can tell us from your perspective what, what it looks like and what it means to think about growth differently? I think uh, for us, uh, I think we changed completely our minds uh, in the last year and um, uh, we had a completely uh, our our journey. We 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 took a very traditional journey of growth. Uh, we we grew the Brie business. We opened for a seed investment, and then we opened for an engine investment. So, but we did like uh, like the 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 rule book of uh, of a startup, and and after doing that, then we realized that there's there's alternatives of. Uh, of uh, growing in in a sustainable in a in a more ethical uh, way it's not about all about numbers and all about um stockists and about volume and so this the last year uh, was very important for us to take a, st a step back and reevaluate uh, where we should uh, be focusing now and uh and Luckily, we we got part of uh, we were part of the uh, another program called business of fashion uh, business of technology, business of fashion technology and textiles textiles technology, uh, which is supporting us uh, a lot on uh, identifying how we can apply uh, tech and how we can apply uh, new technologies or uh, AI in the, the case uh, on uh, on on supporting designers on uh, creating uh, more sustainable designs so this uh, is a completely is a, is, a, is a huge shift from the beginning that uh, was uh, judith saw like we are we are a company focusing on products and now we have um, focused more on services and uh, trying to educate and trying to yeah, uh, be part of this uh, universe as well Thank you. I'm sure there's going to be, a, or I'm sure there already are lots of people doing case studies on on your work and how how you work. So, um, and, and anybody who wants to find out any more about Away to Mars, I know that Zoe's been put some information about Away to Mars and about your work on the VFTT project as well, which uh, which I'm also involved in as well. Um, so uh, all of these things link together. Um, Sabina, from from your perspective, the idea of growing differently, growing different things uh the from uh, what the conventional fashion growth idea is what 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 does that mean is that difficult is that easy is that something that's come naturally for you um it is difficult but it does come naturally because when we talk about sustainability we also need to talk about volumes of clothes that you produce and if you want to grow fast as a fashion business that makes products of course it's a lot about producing more and more and more and more and the more you can produce the cheaper you can make it the better your margins get and so on so when i started to realize that this is going to be the journey if i want to grow in a conventional way um, it just doesn't make sense for me because then I can't react to demand um, as much as we do now. Then I can't be smart about my product decisions. And again, when we talk about sustainability, we don't talk enough about volumes of clothes that we create in businesses. So I think um, for me, it's quite exciting how we can grow uh, by creating new revenue streams. So is there anything else we can add to the business um, by using our resource in a smarter way? Because we have that second pillar, which is the uh, conscious experiences. What can we do in terms of, you know, not creating new products, not using these type of resources, being sustainable, but generating money for the business and grow in that way. So this is something that we find quite exciting. Um, I think it's quite similar to what Alfredo said. We also started off with a uh, um, quite conventional journey, but we are evaluating every year, um, seeing what is important. I think the pandemic showed a lot of the problems we have in the fashion industry. Um, we just can't carry on with growth as we used to do. And also, is it really necessary? I think that's the big question here as well. Thank you, Sabina. Thank you, Sandy. Can I bring you in? Hi. Yes, I just I just wanted to ask uh, Sabina and. Um, particularly about the impact on, uh, I know you've worked a lot with the Fashion Innovation Agency um, at LCF and, and looking to explore different ways of fashion, experiencing fashion. And I wonder what you've, your experience of that working with um, um, 
collaboration and academia has been and the impact? I'm very happy you asked that. Uh, collaboration is key. I think that I was only able to grow um, as an entrepreneur because of these collaborations. The FIA has been quite crucial um, for, for my career, I would say, in general, because, um, again, as a trained designer, I went to Central St. Martins and I just felt there's only one journey for me. There's only one of doing things right, because it's a lot about being accepted by the industry by doing things right <laughs> when you start off you don't want to mess with anyone you don't want to do anything that is a bit too different you know that might be like oh don't do wholesale you know this is not cool don't do fashion week you don't say all of these things you try to kind of fit in but the FIA really showed me that there are so many layers to um, the fashion industry there's so many cool ways to involving technology um, not only you know for showcasing but also beyond that to involve the customer to have a different type of engagement to to look at your own products in a different way because you look at them from a different um, dimension so that was really interesting and academia was equally important for me because um, I also work as a lecturer at London College of Fashion and having that back and forth with students and the future generation of our industry is incredible and super amazing um, and I do think it helps us a lot um, in terms of understanding what uh, the demand is yeah. Thank you. I'm really aware of time um, and that we have a number of questions. Zoe, can I ask you if you can call, come on and or, or at least call out uh, one of the questions or a couple of the questions from the chat, please? Sure, no problem. Um, so Isme from Boy Wonder, who's also one of our lovely MSEs from the project, has um, written a question also about growth. Um, she asked, the business world is entrenched in ideas of growth and profits, which can be very difficult for Messies, which we've obviously touched on. Um, but she's asked, saying awards and funding and PR can be a problem because of this lack of understanding. How can this be tackled? So I think, you know, from the other perspective, rather from the MSEs, what they can do, what can what can the outside or how can we affect the outside world think about it differently? Maybe if you can uh, do a second question as well, just because I'm wary of time, then we, we okay. might be able to take the two together. Thank you. Oh, lots now. Hang on, let me read. Um, there was another question, I don't know how, about um, they're interested to know if the, any of the designers, designers have moved from models of wholesale to direct to consumer, and um, if so, what was the transition like in changing to that model? Great, thank you. So can I, who would like to respond to the first question and then uh, that gives somebody time to think about the second one? I can briefly and, uh, answer the first one. So uh, to begin with, we're hoping that, that this guide can contribute to, to changing the perspective on the growth trajectory. And as Mon said, it's very much about changing mindsets and we detect and know from our work that you know, there's a long way still to go, but we do hope that this work that we've done and the examples of the businesses that we worked with and us trying to disseminate as much from that work and just getting the message out. And also all of us working together, as Sabine and Alfredo said, can help to change the conversation and change the culture of what is expected is the right journey in, in doing this. Thank you, Mila. So maybe I can ask either Judith, Alfredo or Sabina, uh, as far as the second question is concerned, uh, direct to customer. Obviously, Alfredo, your, 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 your model has got the new, new version of that. So, uh, uh, but I don't know whether, who, who would like to respond to that? Judith. Yes, um, absolutely. Yes, I've seen a um, uh, complete change uh, of businesses. Uh, changing from wholesale because they've realized that it's just you know they can't go on any longer just producing more and more and more and actually um, sometimes it's required for them to um, stop um, take a pause and, and actually come back and rethink things uh, which actually isn't a bad thing and I think the industry now and we're getting off that sort of ridiculous sort of roller coaster of season this season that uh, uh, I think it's becoming a little bit more forgiving now. So, um, you know, being able to take time out to uh, reset your business is now uh, more acceptable. And I'm seeing a lot of that taking place. Thank you very much. Thank you. Zoe, is there, uh, we've got three minutes left. One more question, maybe we can quickly squeeze yeah. it. 
There's another question that kind of still related to growth, but about um, how how these businesses are kind of staying small, but also keeping commercially sustainable and generating enough profitability to keep their business running for as long for for, for a long period. Yes, <laughs> that's another one I could answer. Um, really interesting. Uh, uh, it's all about uh, balancing and having lots of things in different baskets. So. Uh, income is generated through lots of things, uh, uh, collaboration, uh, consultancy, people are doing things online in terms of creating experiences, uh, workshops. Uh, uh, it's funny, this was happening a long time ago, and now it is coming back, but actually it's coming back in a different way, and with, uh, you know, digital uh, the reach is massive. So, you know, you can give people the most incredible experiences through workshops. One of the businesses I'm supporting did this most fantastic dyeing workshop and uh, they brought in uh, uh, dyers from India. Uh, so the so the Indian dyers were showing, you know, how they did it. It was a hand dyeing process and it was just wonderful. A really, really enriching experience. So there's lots more opportunities to to, you know, you don't have to be a one-trick pony anymore and you need to be thinking bigger. Yeah, I, just to, to echo that from the um, evidence that we've collated um, and from, from our own work beyond that, you know, it feels now is more exciting time than ever for us to redefine the words fashion design and entrepreneurship and the roles of designers, what they're doing purposely and purposefully uh, really expanding and they're connecting. So as you say, Judith, you know, different roles, whether it's with working with um, uh, as directly with product, working, uh, teaching, working with uh, suppliers, etc. They're, they're all linked together in different ways and they bring out different kind of elements of creativity. So, you know, they um, that government advert that was that that's very famous for, for showing somebody uh, working in the creative sector that they, they were dreaming of a job in, in IT or something. I can't remember what it was exactly. But, you know, th this idea that that people are doing things because they have to. A lot of these fashion design entrepreneurs are doing a number of different things for a reason, because collectively they create more resilience and more resourcefulness. It's not that, oh, but they, they can only make a living if they do this and this. That's, that's a definition of a new, new way of working, which um, is incredibly exciting as long as it's supported, because as Sandy said, or somebody said earlier on around burnout, it's got to be recognized and supported differently. So um, we are bang on four o'clock. I've got to say thank you to everybody here. I've really enjoyed the last hour. It's been incredibly interesting. I could have done with it being longer, but we all have other things that we have to do as well. It's Friday afternoon. Um, I hope everybody online has enjoyed the session. Um, um, and for anybody who uh, hasn't seen it, or if you know people who haven't seen it, it will be online. It will be available to watch again for those who want to come back to it. But I think, yeah, fashion design entrepreneurship is fundamentally changing. However, it will only really reach its potential if it's recognized, supported, and practiced in a way that is really acknowledges um, the full scope of what it can be to, to live and work professionally and personally relating to fashion. So um, this afternoon, I hope has been part of that acknowledgement. Um, and yeah, thank you again to everybody and please keep in touch with us. This is an ongoing process of collaboration and conversation. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 And Judith. Thank, Thank you. you. Pleasure. And Monica and Leela.